there. Um, so this is kind of an inter interesting question. Do we sin? Do we sin less? Is there a possibility of sinning less, or is there a possibility of a life less characterized by sin? And are they the same thing? And this is something I've been thinking about for a while. Well, off and on for a few days. Um, and really, anytime I talk about it, I'm very careful. Uh, I don't know if there's a possibility of sinning less as a Christian, because who can measure? How do you know? You know, there's sins of omission, there's sins of commission. Uh, and this law of sin is always work uh, in your members, lurking, looking for opportunity. And we can walk according to the flesh. And honestly, we walk, mm, I don't think we walk according to the spirit that much. Um, but our, com, com, our concepts are so loaded with legalistic baggage from the natural man that all of our definitions, like what does it mean to walk in the flesh? What does it mean to walk in the spirit? We think that that means sinless. Sinless, not sinless. Um, no, walking in the spirit means a heart, a mind that's renewed and a heart that's full of thanksgiving. That's the simplest explanation I can come up with because in Romans 8, when he's talking about to walk according to the Spirit, it's talking about the mind set on the Spirit, which is life and peace. And it's got to do with the Spirit of Sonship that bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and heirs, in contrast to the Spirit of bondage again into fear and condemnation and the carnal mind. So there's the mind of the Spirit and there's the carnal mind. Um, and Paul, believe it or not, there is talking about the dominion of sin. Because he says in Romans 6, 14, sin shall no longer lord it over you, for you're not, you're not under law, but under grace. And the whole conversation from there on is talking about our death to the law as the means to be delivered from the law of sin and death. Our death with Christ. Um... But we don't know what the law of sin and death is. You know, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And actually it's, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Um, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And we think well that means that I won't sin anymore. No, he's talking about the lordship of sin. Sin shall not lord it over you, for you are no longer under law, but under grace. And then he talks about how Christ condemns sin in the flesh, um, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And we tend to define that as that means I'm going to be righteous in my in my walk and sinless. But Romans three is where we get our definition of righteousness and it is not focused on our righteousness but God's and that Christ is the manifestation of God's righteousness upon those who believe uh, and it, it is that God may be just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus and the whole question is how can God qualify me to be a son and an heir blessed and to have the inheritance and to enjoy the realities of the kingdom when I'm a sinner. Well, David said, Blessed is he to whom God will not impute iniquity and whose sins he will not remember and uh, who has the forgiveness of sins. And with Abraham, it was entirely a matter of inheritance, right? That he would be the heir of the world to come and that Christ uh, told him or God told him that he is his reward, his shield, his exceeding great reward, um, that's all included in what's called justification. Justification is not about making you righteous uh, as a, like a more right person. Justification is about 
Christ being the manifestation of God's righteousness in that he condemned sin in his flesh. He carried out the death penalty on Christ. He righteously paid for the sins that were committed. And now he's just and the just he's just in forgiving our sins to him who works not but believes on him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted in his righteousness and that righteousness is God himself being vindicated in qualifying us to be sons and heirs and that carries all the way through Romans 3 or Romans 8 so when he talks about uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death and what the law could not do and it was weak through sinful flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of flesh of sin and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit and we say well that means I'm going to walk more righteously no it means that God is qualified to not only forgive me in the heavens before the angels but to free me from condemnation inside see it Romans 8 is not talking about condemnation from heaven it's talking about our own inward sense which is called the spirit of bondage and fear so later so after he says there's no condemnation for those who are walking uh, in Christ Jesus who are walking not according to the flesh but according to the spirit later he says for you've not received the spirit of bondage again into fear but a spirit of sonship in which you cry Abba Father the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ and the witness of the Spirit coupled with the intercession of the Spirit because then he starts talking about the how the Spirit intercedes with groanings that can't be uttered in our weakness we sense this futility we have the first fruits of the Spirit we groan within ourselves longing to be clothed that longing is to be delivered from the body of this death and the corruption in it and the law of sin and temptation all that we long to be clothed of that, and there's a spirit that bears witness with our children, spirit that we're children of God and heirs, even though we have this corrupt body, and intercedes with groanings to strengthen us and supply us with himself. And that supply is the blessing of the gospel, the blessing of Abraham, because in Galatians 3, uh, says that, um, the scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying in you all the nations shall be blessed um, and that the that the promise might be to faith to all the seed and uh, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through faith which is the promise of the spirit the spirit bearing witness with me with my spirit that I'm a child of God and an heir strengthens me in the midst of all kinds of doubt and fears um, that arise from my conscience it, from the spirit of bondage and fear that causes me to shrink back hide from God think I'm wrong think he hasn't accepted me and think I'm disqualified because of sins and this is the way sin lords it over believers it lords it over us by putting a demand on us and giving us the sense of loss and fear and in Hebrews 2 it talks about how Christ because the children are partakers of flesh he be flesh and blood he partook of the same that uh, through death he might taste death for every man and that he may destroy him who has power over death that is the devil and may deliver those who through the fear of death were subject all their life to uh, bondage due to fear of death. So Christ came, to, he's talking about how he became our high priest there. And he's going to talk for the next eight chapters about the high priest in Hebrews, but that's what he's talking about in Romans 8 too, is the high priesthood of Christ to deliver us from the spirit of bondage and fear, which is condemnation which is the lordship of sin. How does he do it? By, he, well, he partook of death. He destroyed him who had power over death, that he may deliver those who through fear of death were subject all their life uh, to bondage. And 
that spirit of bondage and fear in Romans 8 is called death. So Romans 8 says that the mind set on the flesh is death. Um, and he says, if you walk according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And we say, well, that means if I don't sin, then I will be blessed. That's not what that's saying. What it's saying is the carnal mind is hostile to God. It's enemy to God. It can't be subject to his law. It is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And by walking in the spirit, and those who are led of the spirit uh, set their mind on the things of the spirit, or those who are according to the spirit set their mind on the things of the spirit, we can be renewed and be... Del it, actually, we agree by agreeing with the gospel with the spirit of sonship who testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and heirs. And that is the atmosphere of the liberty of the sons of God. Um, just read Romans 8, 1 through uh, 17, 18, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. The atmosphere of the liberty of the children of God is the atmosphere of sonship, the atmosphere of blessing, the atmosphere of inheritance, the atmosphere of being reconciled with God, having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, because Christ is the manifestation of God's righteousness, vindicating God, that he can bless us with the Spirit. And the Spirit brings us the sense of freedom and deliverance from the spirit of bondage again into fear, and that is the lordship of sin. So sin shall no longer lord it over you because you're no longer under uh, law, but under grace. So this is kind of a complicated topic, and I just thought I'm going to just blast a bunch of scriptures <laughs> because I don't have time to really get into it. I've talked about this a lot in pieces. But the question is not can we sin less, you know. Uh because how much do we walk in the Spirit? And what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? It doesn't mean to sin less. It means to enjoy the atmosphere of sonship. Um, and it means to have our mind renewed and to go, no, I am accepted in the Beloved. I am qualified. I, that's the, my sins don't keep me from God. And so I can walk in the presence of God. Abraham walked with God. Uh, no, uh, Enoch walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? Does it mean to not sin? No, it means to walk in the consciousness of his presence. And that fills you with a heart full of thanksgiving. So I said at the beginning of this that um, really what the simplest definition of walking in the Spirit is to have a mind that's life and peace, renewed, and a heart full of thanksgiving. Because the gospel produces thanksgiving. When you realize, I'm, a, I'm, right, I'm right with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That produces a totally di different atmosphere. Okay. Now the question is, how much do we walk like that under that kind of realization? I don't know. I mean, we're growing in it, but every day we need to be renewed. And to me, every day I feel like I have to be re reset because my natural inclination according to the flesh is to not think that way. That's what I was talking about yesterday. So the question is, do we sin less? Can we sin less? That's not a good question at all. But can our life be less dominated by sin, characterized by sin? And that I would say, yes, yes, because the lordship of sin is the condemnation. And the person whose life is characterized and dominated by sin means that his whole identity is wrapped up in that sin. It's always the subject he's focused on. And that's because of a spirit of bondage and fear and condemnation. He thinks that that's his whole being. He thinks that that's why he takes it on as an identity is because he's consumed with it. Either consumed with overcoming it or consumed with reconciling himself to it. Well, this is who I am, you know. Um, but we're no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in us. And if anyone has not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he also who raised Christ from the dead will also dwell 
uh, give life to your mortal body through his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, and then it says, therefore we are debtors, brethren, not to live according to the flesh. Now that's an old English way of saying you're not debtors. Because it, earlier it says, there's no condemnation for those who walk uh, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We don't talk like that. Um, it's not saying you are debtors to the spirit. It's saying you're not debtors at all. And we're not debtors to the flesh. And the whole thing about the flesh and the debt, that's where the bondage comes from. Because debt means you have to work it off. And that's where slavery comes from. You, you know, indentured servant has to work his time, like Laban working in, or Jacob working in Laban's house. He had to work so many years to pay his, pay for his bride. We're not indebted to God to pay for the spirit and for the sense of blessing. With sinning less, we're not in debt to the flesh. We are not debtors to walk according to the flesh and pay anything off according to the flesh, make up for anything the flesh did, reconcile the flesh, and the flesh is crucified. We owe it nothing, and we don't owe a certain amount of sorrow or a certain amount of confession or a certain amount of behavior. We get the blessing of the Spirit for free by faith. And this is what it means to walk in the Spirit, is to realize that the Spirit of, the, the spirit of life is free. The supply of the Spirit is freely given, and it comes by the hearing of faith. So from Galatians 3, he said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Christ is set as forth as crucified, right? And then he says this, I would learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith? Does he who supplies you with the Spirit and does miracles among you do so by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? So, no, we're not going to be perfected in the flesh. We want to put the flesh to death and just turn away from it and turn to this Christ by faith in the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And the supply of the Spirit is by the hearing of faith, not by the works of the law. So how do I receive the supply of the Spirit and be in the Spirit and be renewed? Well, preach the gospel to myself because nobody else is preaching it to me. I need to bring myself under the hearing of faith so that the supply of the Spirit, my word is spirit and life, would come to me and quicken my mortal body. If the Spirit of him who raises Christ dwell, dwells in you, uh, raised Christ in the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ in the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his Spirit who dwells in you. This is... And then he says, it, you know, for if you walk according to the flesh, you must die. You're no longer debtors then to the flesh. For if you walk according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And the putting to death of the deeds of the body is putting to death the whole realm of spiritual bondage and fear and slavery and death and condemnation and law that's what he's been talking about for the last two chapters by the time he reaches that point we're not there anymore that's not where we live that's not what we owe that's not what we answer to we answer to that we want to answer to the voice of our shepherd for those who are led of the spirit of god are the children of god for you've not received the spirit of bondage again into fear but a spirit of sonship in which you cry abba father now that to hear his voice and to be led by him means that there's a shepherd speaking and he's saying Abba Father that's our high priest and that's our profession and that's his confession and that's how he delivers us from the spirit of bondage and fear by sharing his own relationship and acceptance with the Father as the beloved son with us so that we're accepted in the beloved and we receive the smile of the Father and actually bask in it as our atmosphere as if we're Christ himself based on his merits and God is free and righteous to do that that's what it means to walk in the spirit uh, to be, live under that kind of consciousness there's no way other than be just absolutely saturated with the truth you know and with the help of the Holy Spirit preaching the gospel to yourself what will that produce will it produce me sinning less I wouldn't even look at it that way. I don't know if I'm sinning less, but I can tell you that my life is less characterized by an atmosphere of sin or characterized by sin. It's not my identification anymore. 
And yes, that changes my life practically and how, what I'm known for. It makes me walk more upright, more confidently, more boldly, more assured, more satisfied, and to have joy, of course. And, and I, guess what? You're going to be washed. Yes. Okay, so it's not a question of sinning less. Do I sin less? No, I probably sin the same. But I'm not living in the atmosphere of it. And my life is not characterized and dominated by it. And sin's lordship is being... is It is broken, but I'm being renewed more and more to walk according to that freedom I have in Christ. The atmosphere of liberty. This is really what the perfecting of the conscience is for. A good conscience. Um, so... Please I, I understand that I get questions all the time from people who are absolutely plagued with sin. It's their whole thing. And they need they want practical tips on how to deal with sin. And the pra and I've always, always used the gospel as the only means to deal with sin. But and I have said and I do say that sins can draw big sins that are totally taking advantage of you where you can't just you just can't stop that thing and you're consumed with it can drop off of you but it's not by focusing on them uh it's the struggle of trying not to do the sin that's keeping you in it and making it bigger and bigger and bigger it's because the law is the strength of sin and i don't have time to unpack that but look at romans 7 sin takes occasion by the commandment and stirs up in me all manner of covetousness and so by the law are the motions of sin that's literally what it says it's not that the law is not spiritual holy and good it's that the i'm carnal sold to sin and the law of sin in my members actually responds to the law of god and stirs up sin in me so that when the law says do not covet and i say there's a law that's good in my mind that says yeah i, I don't want to covet so then I'm going to try not to covet. Well, what am I doing is I'm actually standing up in the flesh and saying, I, you know. But the Christian life is not I, but Christ. And if you think that it's I, then you're walking in the flesh. And if you're walking in the flesh, there's a law of sin in your members. And it will take advantage of your ignorance. And while you're trying not to covet, you will covet more than you've ever coveted before. So there's a lot of Christians who are absolutely bound up in all kinds of sin. And all they can think about is, I've got to stop this thing. How can I stop? Be and the reason is because of the spirit of bondage and fear, which means that they really are not basking in justification. They're not basking in the gospel yet. They need their understanding renewed. And that ignorance is why that sin is the strength of their life and the dominant characteristic and the thing they're consumed with. Okay? So, what's the answer? Is it to overcome the sin? No, it's to get your mind off the sin. Okay, so anyway, um, no, I don't intend to teach that you can sin less, but there are certain sins that people are wrapped up in because of the law, and they gotta get free from that, and their life can be less characterized by sin. Um, and it's dominion. You're, you can't. Anybody who tells you that that's not the case is lying. Or they just don't know, or they don't know the... the and, and see, here's the thing. There's some people who've gotten really confused because I'm talking about this. That think it's legalism and I'm adding to the gospel. Which is just stupid. But these people are legalists. They don't know that they're legalists. But they think that they cannot see any breakthrough in their life. And the reason they think that is because they really don't believe God is for them. You know, it really comes down to that, that they have not really reconciled themselves to God. That's why they're so triggered. And they think they're like Paul, they say they're like Paul the Apostle contending for the gospel. You know, and that we're, uh, we're adding to it, leavening in it, you know. And, and it's because they don't understand what we're saying and they don't appreciate that there's nuance here, you know. And so they can't even consider uh, that the Lord, they're, they're in a place where they've locked themselves down into an argument where it's like, if you even talk about 
that somebody could be free from any of the sins that are plaguing them. You're a legalist and you're adding to the gospel. And the reason they are triggered is because they're in a spirit of bondage and fear about it. And yes, we have to be really careful how we talk about these things and define our terms. Because it is true that by default, if you talk about sin and uh, how God deals with it, chances are you're going to use legalistic language. And we have to be really careful and define everything. It is true. Um, okay, so I wanted to try to talk about that a little bit. This is one of those messages you're probably going to have to listen to four times before you even understand what I said. said. And I, I'm sorry about that. It's just that I, I too many concepts to try to unpack. Alright, take care.